In this video, we will talk about action potential and look at some questions that you may find on a USMLE related to this fairly complicated topic. Everyone knows that when a person touches an object, the nerve endings generate electrical impulses and transmit them to the CNS, but as we will find out, this electrical impulse transmits to the CNS in a form of action potentials. Let us see how. First, let me draw here a part of an afferent nerve ending with ion channels present. As we have discussed earlier, the cell is negative inside compared to the outside. And the resting conditions, the voltmeter shows that the interior of the cell is negative 70 millivolts, and this is called the resting membrane potential. It is very important to know that in afferent nerve endings, there are special mechanosensitive channels which are called mechanically gated channels. When a person touches an object, mechanical stimulation stretches and causes deformation of the membrane of the afferent nerve endings and disturbs and stretches opening these channels. Since we have a high net force on sodium directed inward, when these channels open up, this results in a tiny amount of sodium influx down its electrochemical gradient. Because the sodium is a cation, the interior of the cell becomes more positive, or in other words, the cell slightly depolarizes. Suppose it depolarizes from negative 70 up to negative 60 millivolts. It is very important to know that at negative 60 millivolts, a very big event occurs. Negative 60 millivolt is called the threshold potential. Threshold potential by definition is the membrane potential at which the action potential is inevitable. By reaching the threshold, the two special voltage sensitive channels open up. Voltage gated sodium channels and voltage gated potassium channels. However, it is very important to note that the kinetics of voltage gated sodium channels is very fast when compared to the voltage gated potassium channels. Because of this point, the voltage gated sodium channel is called fast channels. Suppose, due to this reason, by reaching the threshold, three voltage gated sodium channels and only one voltage gated potassium channel open up. Because of that point, because more channels for sodium are open and a membrane potential is very far from sodium equilibrium potential, we get a high sodium conductance when compared to potassium conductance. Therefore, sodium quickly rushes into the cell down its electrochemical gradient and a tiny amount of potassium leaves the cell. Sodium influx dominates over potassium efflux. Because the more positive ion is diffusing into the cell, this makes the membrane potential more positive. The more sodium rushes in, the more voltage-gated sodium channels will open up resulting in increasing sodium conductance. Sodium influx makes the membrane potential more and more positive, suppose up to positive 40 millivolts. The membrane potential moves towards the sodium equilibrium potential, which is at positive 45 millivolts. It moves toward the sodium equilibrium potential because you know that whenever we open channels for any ion, the ion diffuses in or out, always trying to achieve its own equilibrium potential. This sodium keeps rushing in, trying to bring the membrane potential to positive 45 millivolts. However, because the voltage-gated sodium channels are very fast channels, 
they quickly open and quickly close. So at positive 40 millivolts, they suddenly close. Therefore, the sodium conductance begins decreasing. Now, the interior of the cell is more positive when compared to the exterior. On the other hand, at this time, more voltage-gated potassium channels open up and we get high potassium conductance. High potassium conductance means potassium will leave the cell and try to bring the membrane potential to its own equilibrium potential of negative 95 millivolts. Now we are very far from the equilibrium potential for potassium. This means that now we have a great force on potassium directed outward because, you know, the further the membrane potential is from the ion's equilibrium potential, the greater the net force on that ion will be. So potassium leaves the cell, making the membrane potential more and more negative. It is very important to know that when we reach the resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts, potassium efflux does not stop here. However, it continues to leave the cell until the membrane potential becomes negative 90 millivolts. This happens because, as we already mentioned, the kinetics of voltage-gated potassium channels is very slow. They open slowly and close slowly. In addition, we have other channels for potassium which are always open, allowing potassium to move across. They are called potassium leak channels. Due to these two reasons, the membrane potential goes deeper down of the resting membrane potential and then returns to the original resting state. The voltage-gated potassium channels close and efflux of potassium where these channels stops. Now the interior of the cell is again negative. It is extremely important to know that this rapid rising and falling of the membrane potential is what is called an action potential. The action potential has three phases. The upstroke of the membrane potential is called depolarization and a downstroke is called repolarization and below repolarization we have hyperpolarization or after hyperpolarization. Again, by definition, the action potential is rapid depolarization followed by a repolarization. It is very important to know that during depolarization, not a lot of sodium rushes into the cell. We see only a small amount of extracellular sodium refluxing into the cell. Therefore, depolarization does not affect the extracellular sodium concentration. Anyways, this small amount of sodium will be pumped back via sodium-potassium ATPase. And also, sodium-potassium ATPase pumps potassium into the cell and helps to reestablish the resting membrane potential. It is important to know that increasing action potential frequency increases the ATPase work, and this determines the metabolic rate of a neurons. So, we have discussed how we generate the electrical impulse when touching an object. And in order to better understand how this electrical impulse transmits to the CNS via the nerves, we have to talk about propagation of the action potential. Let's draw a neuron and see how the action potentials move from region 1 to region 2 by viewing close up these neighboring regions and reading the membrane potential using voltmeter. In both regions, the resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts, and upper at negative 60 millivolts, we have the threshold potential. When a voltage gated sodium channels open in the first region, 
we get a sodium influx that depolarizes this region and then the channels close. The opening of voltage-gated potassium channels causes potassium efflux and repolarization and the channels also close. It is very important to know that during depolarization, when a sodium fluxes in via voltage-gated sodium channels, the sodium travels forward to region 2, usually 1 to 2 mm in distance. This local current flow causes the membrane potential of the second region to rise to the threshold potential. Reaching the threshold opens a mass of voltage-gated sodium channels and we get sodium influx causing the depolarization. At positive 40 mV, the voltage-gated sodium channels close. However, we get increased potassium conductance because a lot of voltage-gated potassium channels will open up. Potassium efflux causes repolarization and returns the membrane potential to the resting state and then these channels close. Next, the sodium that has been rushing in causing depolarization further moves forward initiating the action potential at the region. If we take a look at neuron, the interior of the cell at this region becomes positive and exterior negative and this process repeats along a neuron. This is exactly how an action potential is propagated along a neuron reaching the CNS, a muscle or glands. It is extremely important to know that the sodium which has been rushing in via voltage-gated sodium channels does not move only forward causing further depolarization, but it also moves backward. However, this does not initiate a second action potential in a backward region. In order to understand why it is so, First, we have to talk about the ion channels that participate in action potential in more detail. There are three ion channels that participate in action potential process. Voltage-gated sodium channels, voltage-gated potassium channels, and potassium leak channels. Voltage-gated sodium channels have two voltage-sensitive gates. At rest, the activation gate or AM gate is closed and the inactivation gate or H gate is open. Both gates respond to a depolarization. During depolarization, the activation gate quickly opens, allowing a sodium influx. Now we will say that the channel is activated. At the end of depolarization, the inactivation gate that responds a little more slowly closes, terminating the sodium influx. At this moment, the activation gate is still open. However, regardless of that fact, now the channel is in an activated state because the inactivation gate is closed. In other words, they are in a non-functional state and cannot establish an open state in response to another stimulus. Now I hope you understand why the action potential cannot move backward. When a sodium moves backward, it cannot open the voltage-gated sodium channels because they have just participated in action potential and are either open or in an inactivated state. In other words, the H gate is closed and M gate is open. This concludes the functionally fast sodium channels are absolutely required for the development of action potentials in neurons and skeletal muscle. In a case where no fast sodium channels are present, means no action potentials will be generated. 
it is very important to know that the mechanisms of action of local anesthetics like cane drugs is precisely based on this concept. If I give cane drugs to the patient, they block fast sodium channels. As a consequence, without functional voltage gated sodium channels, we cannot generate an action potential. This is really important to understand. Also, tetrodotoxin and soxitoxin act in the same way as cane drugs. They block voltage-gated sodium channels, preventing an action potential generation. However, there are other toxins like ciguatoxin and batrocotoxin that act inversely. They keep fast sodium channels open. For example, ciguatoxin is a poison that may be found in some tropical and subtropical finfish. Ingestion of such fish causes ciguatera fish poisoning. It is very important to know that the pharmacology of ciguatoxins and batrocotoxins is characterized by their ability to block inactivation of fast sodium channels. This causes persistent activation and the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels that causes depolarization. As a consequence, it generates an action potential either spontaneously or in response to a single stimulus. In short, in a synapsis, this causes an excessive release of neurotransmitters. Clinically, the ciguatera fish poisoning causes neurological, cardiovascular, and gastrointestinal disorders. Batrocotoxin is another extremely potent cardiotoxic and neurotoxic poison that may be found in certain species of frogs. The last important point about the voltage-gated sodium channels is that they are blocked by extracellular fluid calcium. Therefore, a change in blood calcium concentration has an effect on the resting membrane potential by decreasing or increasing the sodium channel's sensibility. The second important channel uh, in action potential is voltage-gated potassium channel. The voltage-gated potassium channels have only one voltage-sensitive gate. It is closed under resting conditions. Depolarization signals these gates to slowly open because of slow channel kinetics. Repolarization signals these gates to close, but because they close slowly, in early repolarization we get to the peak point of open channels. A very important point here. These channels respond for repolarization because repolarization is always caused by potassium efflux. The third important channel is the potassium leak channel. Potassium leak channels are always open and under resting conditions they allow the potassium efflux and the efflux continues during the action potential as well. Now let's recap what we have said and add some important details. First, the action potential is rapid depolarization followed by a repolarization. Action potentials occur in several types of cells called excitable cells. Excitable cells include neurons and muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells and the cardiac muscle cells. The function of an action potential in a neuron is to conduct neuronal signals and in a muscle cell, they initiate a contraction. 
It is very important to know that even though there are many similarities between neuronal versus muscle cell action potentials, we have some differences between these cell types and most important to our discussion, the duration of the action potential differs. Let me draw here a graph to compare the action potentials in these different excitable cells motor neuron, skeletal muscle, and cardiac ventricle. The action potential in a motor neuron is almost identical to that of a skeletal muscle. They are really fast and short. This means you can generate a high frequency of action potentials in a motor neuron and skeletal muscle cells. On the other hand, the cardiac ventricular action potential has a long duration because of the plateau phase. Therefore, that limits us to a low frequency of action potentials. I'm sure it's obvious because we do not want the ventricle to contract very fast nor at high frequency. It should contract slowly to completely pump the blood out and only then receive a new action potential.